Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rusk. And we're here to give you the tools and knowledge to invest both your time and money better. If you're new, feel free to jump in with our Starter Pack series that aired in early 2022 or our Shares or ETF mini series. We've got plenty to share with you in today's episode, but if you want to catch us on socials, head to Rask Australia on Insta and Twitter. I'm also found at Kate Campbell AUS on Insta. And I'm Owen Rask AU on Insta. Just beware of the fake accounts. We'll never DM you about trading strategies or crypto. And if it sounds a bit weird, it's probably not us. And just one final heads up before we get into the show. This podcast contains general financial information only. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Campbell. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Australian financial expert, Noel Whitaker. With a career spanning several decades, Noel has become a household name in the world of personal finance and investing. In today's conversation, we're going to be discussing his insights on wealth creation, timeless money wisdom, and so much more from someone who has really seen it all. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Noel Whitaker. Well, Noel, welcome on to the Australian Finance Podcast today. It's great to be here, Kate. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And you have been around the world of money and personal finance and investing for quite some time. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey and maybe some of your experiences, because I know you have quite a few. Well, it's it's a long journey, Kate. This is the whole point. I mean, I started as a bank officer way back. So I was a bank officer. And in those days, I knew nothing about money at all even though there wasn't much, I guess, to know about money back when I started in the bank. And then as I, I developed, I worked out that I wasn't as dumb as I thought I was and I, I got higher ambitions in the bank. And then in 1969, I was offered a job to work in a law office and I started doing law. And after a while, I thought law was a bit boring and I got into tax and accounting and I topped Australia in tax, so tax is like my specialty. Then I left there to get a job in a property development company and we used to build and develop properties of, of all sorts. And then I started my own building and retire, a building business. And then about 1980, there was no finance around, no matter how much money you had. So we started a mortgage broking firm to get finance for our clients. And then that became a finance advisory firm about 1984. And I've been with the financial advisory section ever since. You've dabbled in quite a few areas of finance. Well, it it means I've got a good wide knowledge, I think, and experience. I've been a developer. I've been a lawyer. I've been a tax accountant. (laughs) My specialty now is tax and superannuation. My life changed back in 1985 when I picked up a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, the classic, and uh, I made two vows. The first was I'd have my own business within 100 days. It took 160 days, and I would spend the rest of my life promulgating the Napoleon Hill principles. I'm now so pleased that my son James, who's now 40, lives in California, is now the leading authority in the world on Napoleon Hill. He's written two books on it. So it's James who's taken up the challenge from Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie. So you've certainly passed it on to the next generation. It's great when I see a book 
Metal Dynamite, written by James Whittaker and the Publican Hill and Andrew Carnegie. He's in very good company with that one. <laughs> and you've written a few books yourself, haven't you? About 25, I think. But I'm writing one now on estate planning. And it suddenly struck me that the 25 books I've written are all about building wealth. And that takes sacrifices. It takes risks. You never know what the market's doing. The laws keep changing. And accumulating wealth is a bit of a long grind. I mean, it takes time. You need to have the patience to watch the money grow because most people don't have patience. But you get there. In estate planning, it's so simple. You go to the lawyer, you get the documents done, and once a year you update them. So estate planning is so much simpler. Yet 40% of Aussies don't even have a will. Yeah, it's definitely a big issue and we've done a few episodes of lawyers on the past in the podcast to talk about the importance of making a will, but I know it's on a lot of people's to-do lists, but it doesn't quite make it up to the action step level. Well, it's one of those important but not urgent jobs. I mean, right now I've got two enduring powers of attorney. I still haven't got the kids to sign. It's human nature to do things at the last minute, isn't it? Noel, do you remember your very first investment or money experience? Well, my money experience is I've always been a bit of a merchant. So at high school, I kept chooks and I sold the teachers eggs and I had beehives and I sold honey. So I guess I've been a merchant for a long time. Probably the first investment was a house I bought, I guess. That was way, way back. It cost about $7,000. Crazy numbers. (laughs) I sold it for $12,000. A comparative house last week sold for $800,000 in Brisbane. It's crazy stuff. Those numbers are quite hard to imagine these days. Well, when we had the building company in 1974, we were selling a low-set brick house for about $30,000. The average house was about 30 grand and the average wage was about $15,000. So the average house was twice the average wage. And that was why even though interest rates were around 14%, people could afford a house. It's quite different now, isn't it? Oh, yes. Now, you've been investing and managing money and talking about money for quite a long time now. And I'd be keen to hear What are some of the biggest changes you have seen when it comes to personal and finance and investing over the last few decades? Well, if I can just rephrase something, the basic principles have not changed. 80% of people still spend more than they earn. Most people leave it far too late. You know, they get to 20, 35, oh, I'm busy with the mortgage and the kids. And the wedding, I mean, some people pay $35,000 for a wedding, for God's sake, which I think is a total waste of money. Then they get the 50, oh, my God, I'm 50, I better start working. Well, the whole thing about the way numbers work, that the best results come over time. And I always tell the story of the lily in the pond, which starts as a tiny speck and doubles every day. And the question is, how long to go from a tiny speck to full? If it doubles, if it takes 10 days to fill the pool. How long to go from quarter full to full? And the answer is two days. It goes from quarter full to half on the ninth and half to full on the 10th. Now, if that 10-year term, that 10-day, was your investment time and you were forced to harvest on the 8th, because you started late, you're missing out on three quarters of what you could have had. Now, the way around that, I often show to people, if you're 60 with half a million dollars in in super, if you can wait and work for five more years, that's 800,000. It increases by 40%. Work five more years, it's 1.2 million. So people must understand they've either got to work longer or start earlier. That's the way numbers work. And that hasn't changed. Everybody, we all leave things to the last minute, right? Half Australians have not got around to writing a will. I'll get around to it. 
They don't get around to starting the savings plan. And that's why a major step in my new book for young people is follow the process because the process will get you there, but anything worthwhile takes time. You can't lose 100K overnight. You can't get muscles overnight. You can't become a champion sportsman overnight, and you can't make a fortune overnight. You have to go through the process and and take the time to do it. Mm. One of the questions we often get asked from listeners who maybe are 40 or 50 years old is, is it too late? Because they're listening to all of this information going, I wish I started when I was 20 or when I was 30. What do you say to people in that camp? It's never too late. And the biggest factor that determines how much money you will have when you retire and how long your money will last after you do retire is the rate of return you can achieve. Now, 80% of Australians are disengaged with their super. If you're 40 or 45 and you're not in a top performing fund, well, there's half a million dollars to start with. These are the basics. It's the rate you get determines how much you'll have. And I always say to people, the best map in the world would be useless if you didn't know where you were. So the first thing you do is write down where you are right now. And on my website, it's an action plan to do that. And you write down your house if you've got one and your debts and your super and any loans and credit card debts, and that's your starting point. And each of those can trigger actions to set you on the path of goals. The two biggest things in my book for young people, 10 simple steps, is A, spend less than you earn, and secondly, have goals. Now, if you're a person who spends less than you earn and you've got goals, you're unstoppable. You're on the path. Most people don't do that. So you can't be like most people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying it's amazing how just a few simple steps when you're younger can have such a big difference over the course of your life. And if you're 40 or 50, you can still look at your super. Are you in the best performing fund? Like I was talking to a guy, he's a retired lawyer. He won't fly business class. He only flies coaches. This is going overseas. He had $4 million in shares and was paying $40,000 in fees to his broker, a 1% fee. I said, you're wasting 40 grand a year. So you look around, am I wasting stuff? You should never be paying the brokers an ongoing fee. I've got a broker and I pay them if, if I buy or sell something. That's all you do. So you need to watch all those things because, again, it's inertia. We've got all these fees going out. Oh, we haven't got around to checking them up. Now, I was playing golf with a mate. He said he got on to one of the private health funds and by talking to them, saved $150 a month because he had stuff he didn't need. When they're retired, they don't need obstetric cover. They're not having babies. He's happy to take a bigger excess. So when you write down where you are, that's where the action plan starts. Given you've just written a book for young people, uh, we've talked about setting goals and sort of understanding where you are. What else would you tell your 20-year-old self if you could go back and give past Noel some advice about their finances and setting goals? Well, I think the most important thing is spending less than you earn. I mean, the gorgeous book, The Richest Man in Babylon, written in 1926, the major theme is a part of all you earn is yours to keep. That's where you start. And to me, you it works like this. You spend less than you earn. You improve your skills. Improved skills should lead to a higher income, if not change jobs. Invest a higher income. And make sure that your investing is your first spend. See, most people get paid and they pay the butcher and the bottle shop and the petrol station and the mortgage payments and the school fees. And then they try to save what's left, and there's never anything left. Those people who put the investments away first, there's a thing we used when we had the business. We'd say to people, right, 
make a list of your essential expenses. That's your rent or mortgage payments, school fees, car payments, all that sort of stuff, health insurance, and total that. Now, if that's 52 grand a year, yeah, you're paid fortnightly, then you put $2,000 out of every pay in a separate bank account, and that's all covered then. Just by doing that, you've got all those things covered. Because most people, the discretionary expense is the first expense. Your discretionary expense, that's what you can do. That's your drinks and your clothes and all the stuff you can have fun with. That should be the expense at the end. If there's nothing left, you can't afford it. And credit cards, I think, are the biggest danger. I say it, debit card, not have it, a credit card. When the credit card statement comes, everybody says the same thing. I didn't know it was going to be that big. Your credit card statement is always more than you think, isn't it? Always. But if you start investing, it uh, will build up in the same way as a credit card debt. But you've got to start. The hardest thing is starting. Most people intend to start and they never do. That ties into the next question I had, which was something you had in your book, Making Money Made Simple, which was the why bother question, because sometimes it can feel really pointless to start saving, investing, changing your finances when you maybe only have a really small amount of money left over at the end of each week. And I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on how you approach or encourage someone who's maybe thinking, why bother getting started? Well, it's not the money, Kate, it's the habit. That's the difference. If you don't bother, then you will spend more than you earn and you can never get started. And once you start to spend more than you earn, then you rely on credit cards and you're living on debt. And if you're living on debt, then you need to take some money out of this payday to pay for debt from last time, which means there's less money in this payday to pay what you've got to pay. So it's, it's the habit. You have to understand that all things are slow to start. If you're learning golf or the piano, it takes time. It's slow to start. There's ups and downs. That's life. There's no shortcuts. The biggest tree starts as a tiny seed. And the bigger the tree, the longer it takes to grow. It's hard at the start of your journey to look 40 years ahead, though, and, and plant those trees sometimes, isn't it? Yes, but I mean, you have short-term goals. If you're 16, it might be to buy a car. That's one of the things I cover in depth. I mean, you've got to become a goal setter. So you're 16, 17, okay, my goal is to get a car. So first, as I say in the book, the first question, do I save and pay cash or save a deposit and borrow? And I run the examples in that book that it may be well better to save half and borrow the rest. Because if you pay it back quickly, with the, the interest won't be much. Then once the car's paid off, you've achieved that. Now you're saving a house deposit. If you find a potential partner who's on the same savings track, you've got twice the savings. And once you've got your house deposit, the next goal is to pay your house off. So it's step after step. It's goals, goals, goals. There's no other way to do it. Just keep building on top of each goal. Yeah. You need to know where you want to go. First thing is, okay, where do you want to go? I want a car. Okay. Well, how do we get the car? i got to save up. Okay. How do I earn more money? Okay. Well, now maybe the neighbor's dog needs walking. I know a kid makes 30 bucks a week. He puts out, out the bins in the cul-de-sac he lives in. Once you start, things happen. Yeah. I know one of the goals that many people that listen to this podcast have is to work towards financial independence. And that looks different for everyone. But I know you shared some really good principles for attaining financial independence. Well, well you need to work out what that means. And there's all sorts of answers here. To me, financial independence is you pay the bills when they come in. Now, if you're spending properly, and you're budgeting, and you've got your goals, then your bills should be under control. And then you should have a surplus. Then you decide how to invest a surplus. I always say, once you buy your house, get your mortgage under control. Once it's under control, then you can spread your wings a bit. 
I mean, if you've got the house under control, you may want to borrow 50 grand to buy shares. And if you buy an index fund that can't go broke, paying you 4.9% franked. Are there any other strategies that, apart from the investing part and working towards paying off your house, maybe more mindset that you would encourage people to think about if they're working towards financial independence? There's a thing I push in Making Money Made Simple and in the new book, 10 Simple Steps. You need a mastermind group. That's a Napoleon Hill principle. You work better in a group. He always said the group, the wisdom of the group is bigger than the sum of the parts. Now, if you say, I'm going to start a budget and you've got to meet your group next week, oh, well, I better report some good news to the group. And the group helps each other. I think your mastermind group is one of the most powerful things you can do. And that's a basic Napoleon Hill principle. Mixed with like-minded people. Mixed with people who are in line with your goal. And there are some people who spend, oh, it doesn't matter. Won't matter. Just spend it tonight. That's all right. You know. Other people know, well, we're, we're all on a savings track. If you've got three couples going out for a meal and they're all saving, then they're all going to be prudent. There's a lot of benefit in sharing your goals with people and having people to keep you accountable to them, especially along the journey. That's the purpose, yes. Well, A, talking about the goals reinforces them. Yeah. You write your goals down, you talk about them, and then you support each other. Okay, Kate, how are your goals going? Oh, God, it's been a bad week. Okay, well, we've all had bad weeks, but, you know, we'll get around that. Oh, well, the car broke down. Okay, unexpected expense. That's all right. Because it's never a straight line. You will be going up, then you're going down. There'll be good weeks and bad weeks and good months. You might get a pay rise. Then all of a sudden, you have an unexpected cost. And if you've got a house, you know there's always unexpected costs. Yeah, my uh, I've just been replacing a few things in my house recently, so it's always a bit of a surprise. Always. <laughs> There's always something. Always something. And you touched on an important point, which was sharing when things aren't going as well with your friends and accountability partners, because sometimes you might get completely off track towards your goals. And if you can be honest about that and they can help you and support you get back on track, that's really important as well. Absolutely. People always work best in groups. There's no doubt about that. It's nice to talk about things with people. I mean, I can talk about things with my friends. And sometimes the ideas will then come to me. It's not necessarily the ideas will come from your group. The ideas come to you as you talk to the group because you're verbalising them. The main thing is to take action. It's no good hearing this podcast. Oh, that was great. You've got to do something about it. Yeah. And you and I can't make people do that. But once you write down where you are, okay, that's the next step. Then how do we work out our goals and then translate what we got? If you're overspending, okay, first step, get the credit card bills paid out and start a debit card. Once you've got a debit card, you can't overspend. Yeah, I like how you break it down very simply because a lot of us think it has to be more complicated than it needs to be. And you can actually manage your finances quite simply if you just follow a few basic principles that have been around for a long period of time. Yeah. My first book was called Making Money Made Simple. So many people said you wrote Making Money Made Easy. I said, no, the name of the book is not Making Money Made Easy. It's Making Money Made Simple. And simple is not the same as easy. It's simple to check the tyre. It's simple to check the air in the tyres of your car and check you've got petrol. But for some people, they don't get around to it. I like that distinction because there's a lot of things that we could do at any point, but we don't often do them or they fall to the bottom of the to-do list, like writing a will, which is a massive issue in Australia. Exactly. Now, I've just done our enduring powers of attorney. I still haven't had them signed yet. You know, it's my fault. It's sitting there to be signed but by the kids. Yeah. I think the do list is the big one. You write down what you're going to do today. And that's what I live by. Okay, I've got to write this column, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And you put them down in order and you work on it. And it works every time. Otherwise, you'll get stuck in the emails. Now, in this podcast, both my kids have rung me. (laughs) 
as we're speaking. If it's James from California and our daughter up the road, you get distracted. So you've got to be focused on your do list. It's really important to focus, especially on when you're working towards some of those goals. And I'd be keen to hear what you think are some of the positive and maybe less so positive habits of people who manage their finances. Well, okay. Well, I think the biggest habit is somewhere there's a goal mine out there. So you take tips from your mates. They treat the share market as a gambling casino. Remember COVID and Robin Hood became the big thing. Maybe everyone got on Robin Hood trading stocks. Well, as Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett said, young people trading stocks is like giving an addict cocaine. It's addictive and most traders fail. As I said, look, my conclusion after many years of investing is the index fund is so simple. It's all so boring. It's done a 9% round for 120 years. Now, I bought some shares in Magellan. I bought 50 grand at a dollar, and they went to $70. How good's that? And I sold half. Now they're back to $8. But what I'm saying is, I don't know how I did it. It was a lucky break. So I think too many people are trying to find the winner because every newspaper, oh, buy sell, this is good, that's bad, get rid of this. It's always in the news. If you just say, right, I'll just go to the index and leave that be, the cost to nothing, like your cost to like 0.002% or something, it can't go broke, it's just a match of the, the index. And that to me is easy. And people keep asking me, when's the next recession coming? Are we having a recession? What's going to happen? I got no idea. All I know is in 10 years' time, we'll be better than we are now. That's all I know. You can't think short term. You've got to focus on your goals and ignore all the noise which keeps coming all the time. See, the papers are get the bombardus. The papers now, I've seen the systems. They've got computer things which track us all the time, and they know exactly how to get us. And we fall for it. The moment we see it and we pick up the news down on mobile phone, oh, God, something's happened, a share's up, share's down, doom and gloom, rates up, rates down. We're bombarded by all this stuff on our, on our phone. And I look at it too. Can't help myself. And the first thing I do every morning is look at Wall Street because Wall Street will tell me what our market's going to be. But I never do anything with it. But I feel good if it's green and bad if it's red, even though I'm not touching my portfolio. I just let it sit. I mean, my portfolio is now designed, if I drop dead tomorrow, my wife could handle it. Keeping things simple. Yeah. There are a couple of dogs in there which I got tips on at golf and they've all failed me. So <laughs> It's always good to hear that the experts uh, learn from their mistakes as well. <laughs> well, no one knows what the market's doing. That's the whole point. Uh, the market will do what the market will do. And I think you've either got to leave it to experts or be a stock picker yourself. If you're a good stock picker, go for it, but I can't do it. I'm interested, changing topics slightly, you talk a lot about helping young people learn about money and things like that in some of your books, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the bank of mum and dad, and not just in the property sense, but in parents sort of financially giving their children a leg up and maybe not always teaching them the skills about money alongside that. And I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on ways to support maybe people in the 20s and 30s, like your adult children, to build their own financial future. Okay. Now, you must take a view on this. My wife and I took the view we'd rather help them now than when we're old and they're old. I mean, if we're 100 and they're 80, what's the point? You help them now. If they're, now we've helped our three kids, we've helped them all. But they're good kids. If they're good kids, you can say, right, if you save a thousand, I'll give you ten thousand. Or hundred, I'll give you five hundred. You can match it. But if they can't save a bob, don't help them. Until they learn to budget properly, and that's the time to help, I think. And don't forget they will do what you do. Kids copy their parents. If you're as in debt, oh, the credit card comes in, I can't pay it, I'm in trouble. That's what the kids will pick up on. But you can say, right, this is what we do. 
These are our bills for the month. This are the mortgage payments, school fees, da da da. That's why every pay I take this much out in a special bank account. And you can teach them that. Kids are great learners, but you've got to sit down with them and do it. We often don't realise how much we learn about money, both good and bad lessons from our parents until later on in our lives, don't we? Well, when I was a young bank officer, (laughs) there were no ATMs and debit cards. You withdrew your money on Friday night to see you through to Monday. Uh, So you needed to work out what am I going to spend on the weekend on sporting and beers and all that stuff and Hamburg and everything else. And you took it out. Well, now you just go to the wave your card and you've got it. And the trouble is that when you wave your card, it doesn't feel like spending real money. I mean, occasionally I get a hundred dollar note and it's agony to spend it. Agony. But I can swish a hundred just like that. Now, that's the trouble now. We, get, we got used to tap, tap, tap. We don't feel it. And that's one of the problems. It becomes so easy. Do you have any ideas on how we might be able to more fully feel the weight of our purchases since we can't really go back to cash because many stores won't even accept it nowadays? I think in that case, I mean, if I go out to buy something, I've worked it out first uh, and I know what I'm going to spend. And with a debit card, and some credit card, I can see on my phone the balance straight away. I know exactly what I've got. I make the purchase and bang, it's on the debit card, which is great. Uh, That's a good way of doing it. I use my ING debit card overseas, and I can make a transaction. If I buy a hamburger, then I discover it costs me 50 or 60 bucks after the tip and the conversion and the state tax, and I I can look at it. I love having it on your phone. It's great because you can see the transaction and the balance. So using the data that you get from technology in a positive way and maybe looking at it more often so you understand your spending patterns and where your money's going. Yes, I guess yes. As I said, that's important when you're overseas because you get overseas, the costs are frightening. You, whether you're in Britain, France or America, it's the same number. A cup of coffee is still four or five. If it's America, 20% tip, 10% California tax, and 1.6 conversion, the $5 coffee becomes a $12 coffee. I was overseas earlier this year and uh, you just sometimes didn't, you just couldn't look, (laughs) especially with the conversion of the currency in London. Right, then, yeah, but you've also, in London, you've got your VAT and a 20% service charge. It's more than double. And a meal in London's 40 pounds. That's 100. A bottle of wine's going to be 60. That's 130. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And having the debit card, you know exactly what it costs. Are there any ways that you've used technology in other areas of your finances to make things easier? In my self-managed super fund, I use a program, which I always know exactly where I am, which is useful. That's P-R-A-E-M-I-U-M, premium. And that's a service which keeps track of my my self-managed super fund. That's my main one, I think. I couldn't live without that. Yeah, because we've been talking about... Oh, plus Huda. Huda. Plus on my Apple Mac, I couldn't do without Huda. H-O-U-D-A-H. It searches my computer only, and every document I've written is on there. I can go right back to 1982 documents. If I want to find a word like smoking, bang, I've got it. I can find any word instantaneously. Huda, H-A-U-D-A-A. It's only for apples. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know a program like that existed. It's magic. I use mine three or four times a day, at least, always. Well, we said, now, last time we saw those people, well, he owned the big chain of shopping of shops. You asked him about buy now, pay later. When was that? Within two seconds, who'd have told me it was 14 years ago? I could go straight to the document. Yeah. When did you ask use the word smoking? Straight to it. It's extraordinary. It's about 30 bucks a year or something. It's no money. I couldn't be without it. Yep. Speaking of buy now, pay later, what are your thoughts on that area? Because it's changed the way we're consuming things, hasn't it? I think it's frightening. If you accept the premise you spend less than you earn, Buy now, pay later 
means you spend it before you even got it. And there's ads now about getting your pay early. There's a guy and a girl at a restaurant. He's a bit nervous about the bill. She wants lobster. Up comes the angel. It's fine. Have your lobster. Get, get your pay now. Take out your phone. Flick, flick, flick. And the money's in your bank account to be repaid from your next pay. If you can't live on today's pay, then you've got to lose half of it on the next pay because you've pre-spent it. It's madness. should be banned, I think. And it gets you into a tough cycle as well. Well, all the algorithms are designed to get you in. Live it up now. This is important. Hop into it. Have the lobster. Why should you wait? Why should you wait for your pay? It's not fair the boss has got a week's use of your pay. Grab it now. Spend it now. It is terrifying. The whole concept is terrifying. Don't let the boss have your pay. You get it early. Frightening. It's quite challenging to deal with and even just the sheer number of ads we see on social media pushing these services and pushing the products that offer these services as well. Well, see, every time you click, there's a 1,000 people behind the screens working out what you've done next and the ads will be targeted to you. That's the thing about it. You know, those companies know exactly what we're doing. So we've got to be on guard. I've got a big chapter about enemies in that book. One of my principles is understand your enemies because they're your big enemies. It's buy now, pay later. It's terrible. Credit cards, enemy. You don't have credit cards. Debit card. If a credit card means you're spending money you haven't got. Are there other, any other enemies we should be aware of when it comes to our finances? Probably peer pressure. Well, if they've got one, I want one. They had a big wedding. They paid 40000 for their wedding. I think we need a big one as well. But see, if your goal is to get a house, you won't spend forty grand on the wedding. You just won't. You've got to make sure your behaviour matches your goals. And that comes down to being super clear about what you want and what you're working towards. Exactly. You have your goals and you write them down. Yes. Now, my goal is to buy a house. I won't be diverted. Now, I've got a guy, a friend, he's a physio, he was telling me his finances are terrible. Oh, well, I've just got to have this $30,000 overseas trip. I just have to have it. I said, okay, well, that's your choices. And I know it's it's on your bucket list, but surely getting out of finances is also on your bucket list. Oh, no, but I've I've got to have the whole day. Okay, well, you know, you have it, you have it. There's a lot of trade-offs there and like what do you want now versus what you want in the future and you might be able to get something but it means something else in the future. The ice cream and the bicycle. The ice cream today or the bicycle next week. It's one of the old sayings. The ice cream and the bicycle. No, I think about it. It'd probably take a lot of ice creams to buy a bicycle these days. <laughs> well, I pay eight bucks. Some of the ice creams are eight bucks. <laughs> Maybe if you're getting the, the fancy gelatos in Fitzroy. Well, I like the gelatos. I love them. <laughs> I think, as I said, it's basics, really. You've got to decide what you want. You must spend less than you earn. You must have your goals. You have your goals by writing down where you are. You write down your housing loan and the interest rate. Can I get a cheaper interest rate? Maybe yes, maybe no. Can I pay the loan back a bit quicker? Don't forget, we don't miss what we don't get. Now, one of the reasons Making Money Made Simple was so famous back in 87 was I talked about paying your house mortgage fortnightly and not monthly. And the banks rubbished it. But if you're paying 1000 a month, just to keep it simple, you pay $12,000 in a year. If you pay $500 a fortnight, $13,000. You don't miss the extra payment. You don't miss what's taken out of your salary. That's why salary sacrifice to super is so good. You don't miss it. It's those small changes that add up. Yeah. If the boss doesn't offer salary sacrifice, then just make a deductible contribution. Just have $1,000 a month or something taken out of your pay to super. It's easy. Direct debit is very powerful. So we always pay our bills but we don't normally save. I must pay the rent, must pay the mortgage payments, must pay the school fee, 
well, how about you must pay your super? And that's the difference. Treating your future as a bill. Absolutely. The investment's the first thing. But what's the point of working for 40 years for everybody else? I mean, if your whole pay goes to Woolworths and Ampol and the bank, how about you? You must pay yourself out of every single pay. That's the richest man of Babylon theory. It's everybody's theory. It's the basic. I think that's a fantastic principle to leave people with, Nolan. If people come out of this conversation, they only take one thing away, what would you want that one thing to be? Well, you you must have goals. You must spend less than you earn. You combine those things, I think it's all you need. Plus buying my books. There's all my website. There's all the calculators there. Look, I was out at a restaurant last week, one of the dearest restaurants in Brisbane. I was shocked by the price of it, to be honest. And this guy walks over. He said, oh, no. He said, I'm, I want to thank you. I bought your book years ago. That's why I'm here having a meal with my family because I can now afford it. I get this feedback all the time. Your books have changed my life constantly. It's pretty amazing. It's a great feeling. Yeah, I know you have quite a lot of resources on your website, so I'll include links to that and the books in the show notes. Are there any other resources or things you want to share today? Well, every all the resources, like I like the ASIC website's great, but all those are in my, in my books anyway. Fantastic. I've got a do list on my website. I've got the 20 commandments of wealth on the website. It's all on the website. I've made it easy for people. As we said in the last book, it's all there. You're standing on gold, pick up the shovel and start the dig. I love that. Well, Noel, thank you so much for joining me on the Australian Finance Podcast today. Thanks, Kate. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. We hope you learned something new and were able to take one thing away from this episode. If you're keen to learn more, head on over to Rask Education and take one of our free money and investing courses. You could even become a Rask Core member for less than your Netflix subscription each month. And don't forget to subscribe for new episodes in your inbox every week. Plus, if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and send any questions our way via the link in the description. And before we go on, did this podcast contain personal financial advice just for me? Absolutely not, Kate. Our podcast actually contains general financial information only. What that means is the information does not take into account your financial needs, goals, objectives, or even your situation. So because of that, it's important that you consider if the information is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on it. If that all sounds a bit confusing or you're still working out what your needs are, it's a great idea to consult a licensed and trusted financial planner. And don't forget to do your own research. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investmart.com.au slash bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.